My name is Beth Henry, and this is entry number seven. Chapter seven describes the sailing journey of Dracula from Europe to his new home aboard the schooner Demeter. Most of the chapter is told in first person, including excerpts of the captain's log of the sailing vessel. My entry is inspired by the captain's disastrous and terrible voyage, in which he was helpless to prevent the loss of his crew to the monster aboard his ship. I was struck by the similarities of his narrative to that of an emergency room physician in New York City during the early days of the pandemic. Warning, it is truly terrifying, because it is true. I am in Karachi, Pakistan on March 2nd when I read the news. New York City has its first patient hospitalized with the coronavirus. Though I am more than 7,000 miles away, I am already worried about what I will face when I return home to my job as an emergency room doctor in the city. Even in the best of circumstances, the ER can be swamped. I know the situation with COVID-19 is already dire in different parts of the world, Italy especially. Could our hospitals be overtaken that quickly? March 8th. COVID-19 cases, 14. Back in New York City, the hospital feels like its normal, hectic self. An ER doctor in Bergamo, Italy, tells me about how he had two cases side by side one day. One man was around 65 and had been on a ventilator for 10 days. He had heart problems and he wasn't improving. To his left was another man, about the same age but healthy. His breathing was becoming faster and shallower. Over the course of two minutes, the doctor decided to take the ventilator away from the first man and give it to the second one. If you think of it as saving the most number of lives, that's it, you have to do it, he said. But I'll become an ice cream maker instead of a doctor if I have to go on this way. Will I, too, feel that way soon? We are starting to see some cases in our hospitals, but it's nothing like what the doctors in Italy are describing. They warn me that we are about two weeks behind them. March 15th. COVID-19 cases, 330. A man in his late 80s is sent in from a nursing home with a fever, cough, and diarrhea. He is my first patient who is most likely COVID positive. I can't know for sure because tests are taking up to 24 hours to come back. Although the man is designated DNR, DNI, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, his family, with death now looming, reverses his order. The man hasn't walked in years. He has advanced dementia and was unable to talk even before this most recent illness. Under normal circumstances, we are to follow the family's orders. They are in the waiting room, unable to come in because of our new, strictly enforced, no-visitor policy. Because of how infectious the virus is and the country's lack of preparation and equipment, the decision to intervene is also a question of how best to distribute risk among health care workers. I want to do everything for my patients, as much as they and their families want, just as we have always done. But what do I owe future patients? What do I owe my colleagues? We are weeks away from the full impact of this outbreak, but we are already trying to conserve masks, gowns, and face shields. March 22nd, COVID-19 cases, 9,045. It seems impossible to avoid getting infected. I make mental calculations to keep all protective equipment on for my eight-hour shifts. During my 12-hour shifts, I'll remove it only twice to eat or drink. I was shocked when they first told us to use single-use masks for the whole day. Now we are told they must last multiple shifts. We can discard them if they become visibly soiled. Updated clinical recommendations are given to us to follow. If patients' oxygen levels are slightly below normal, send them home anyway if they look okay. Let's hope they know when to come back, I think. Paramedics say they are seeing 300 dead-on-arrival cases in one day citywide instead of the usual 50 or so. I get texts from colleagues across the country about doctors who are infected and hospitalized, some in the ICU, some intubated. I look at my reused mask. It doesn't seem soiled yet. I put it back on my face. March 24th, COVID-19 cases, 14,905. In New York City this week, the conversation shifts. The question of who gets a ventilator and who doesn't comes up in every single Zoom meeting among ER physicians that I participate in. We want guidelines. 
a colleague announces during a meeting, soon I'm just not going to intubate the 80-something-year-old patient who doesn't talk or walk so that there will be a ventilator available for the 30-year-old who comes in later. It sounds heartless, but we agree with her. One of my residents asks me, will there be ventilators for us if we need them? March 26, COVID-19 cases, 23,111. When I walk through the hospital doors, intubated patients of every age are on ventilators everywhere. It's eerily quiet. Family members and friends haven't been allowed into the ER for more than a week. Most of the patients are too sick to talk. The few without breathing tubes are muffled by their masks. Oxygen hisses in the background. A couple of hours into my shift, one of the nurses falls apart. She sobs out words of anger and frustration and sadness. The morning has crushed her. A co-worker tells me he used three masks during the course of his shift. Three masks, I respond. That's crazy. Then I realize I am the absurd one. The masks are meant for single use, one per patient encounter. My colleague had used three masks over a 12-hour shift, most likely having seen upward of 30 patients who potentially had COVID. In Italy, healthcare workers believe that they themselves expedited the spread of the virus. March 28th, COVID-19 cases, 30,766. When I get to work the next day, a patient who had a breathing tube inserted overnight had woken up enough to pull it out. She was delirious, lacking oxygen to her brain, and had also yanked out her IV lines. Sputum and blood and sweat are flying everywhere in the room. Before I go in, I force myself to pause, put on all the equipment. I place the N95 respirator on my face and a surgical mask over the N95 to keep it clean and reusable as we're instructed, as well as gown, goggles, gloves, and a face shield. It's so hot, I start sweating immediately. We manage to reinsert her breathing tube and replace her IV lines. She safely makes it to the ICU. After an hour working like this, I feel lightheaded, but it's too early to remove the mask and drink water. How do I make it through the next 12 hours? I try to preserve the equipment that I do have, but the steps seem futile. In the ER, I sanitize, glove, remove glove, sanitize again. I have to touch a door handle to go into the workroom to type my clinical notes. I'm unable to sanitize again because there are no more portable hand sanitizers left. I get flustered when I accidentally touch my face, wondering how I slipped. Sometimes I can't remember if the gloves on my hands are clean or dirty. People are now referring to ours as a third world country, but in terms of PPE in this pandemic, it's actually worse than overseas hospitals. A few doctors who are consulted for their expertise have balked at having to see patients here. They feel unsafe, they say. Deep down, I know they're probably right. March 30th, COVID-19 cases, 38,087. One day, a grandfatherly man, who speaks softly and smiles sweetly, comes in with oxygen numbers dipping as low as 75%, he feels good, he says, and his breathing is fine. Just a little tired, don't worry, he says. Despite everything I know so far, I think he will do okay because he looks so well. The next day, I see he is now confused. Even wearing an oxygen mask, he could not sustain levels above 90% overnight. He had previously decided that he did not want to be on a breathing machine, so we make him comfortable with morphine. I want to spend time with him. But more patients, much younger patients, keep arriving, struggling to breathe. The disease has won against him. The new patients have a chance. I don't want to think that way, but it is a dismal truth of our new situation. April 1st, COVID-19 cases, 47,440. We try putting a few patients prone on their stomachs. It's said to help intubated patients. Why not give this a try with those who don't have breathing tubes but aren't oxygenating well? I see a patient's oxygen level shoot up. It works, I yell out elatedly. We need massage tables with the cut-out face holes, I joke to my resident. An 89-year-old woman is brought in by ambulance with an oxygen mask covering most of her small face. She tells me, I don't want a breathing tube. I'm almost 90 years old. I've lived... I call her niece and family members. Well, can't we overrule what she wants? Think about what you know of her, I say. What does she value? 
they agree that dying peacefully would be what she would want. Later, she grabs my fingers, tells me she feels cared for. She doesn't want to let go. I don't want to either. I look down at my purple-gloved hand holding hers, delicate and bony. I hate that she doesn't get an actual human touch before she departs from the living. April 5th, COVID-19 cases, 67,552. This will end, I tell myself. This will end. I am hardly responding to family and friends anymore. It feels impossible to explain to them what's going on. Even doctor friends in Philadelphia, Boston, Los Angeles seem like separate species now. It has been less than six weeks, but I've never felt less useful as a doctor. We spend our days talking to patients and families about the limits of medicine. We call people to tell them their loved ones have passed away. Then we make another call, and another. The one thing I can do, what I think will matter most in the end, is just to be a person first for these patients and their families. Staying human is painful, but it is what I need to keep working, even if it makes each moment more difficult to endure.